when people told themselves their past with stories, explained their present with stories, foretold the future with stories. The best place by the fire was kept for the storyteller. The Ascension of Christ from the Mystical City of God by the Mystic Venerable Mary of Agreda, Book 6, Chapter 12. A few days before the Ascension of the Lord, while the Blessed Mary was engaged in one of the above-mentioned exercises, the Eternal Father and the Holy Ghost appeared in the cenacle upon a throne of ineffable splendor, surrounded by the choirs of angels and saints, their present and other heavenly spirits, which had now come with the Divine Persons. Then the incarnate word ascended the throne and seated himself with the other two. The ever humble mother of the Most High, prostrate in a corner of a room, in deepest reverence adored the most blessed Trinity and in it her own incarnate son. The eternal father commanded two of the highest angels to call Mary, which they did by approaching her and in sweetest voices intimating to her the divine will. She arose from the dust with the most profound humility, modesty, and reverence. Accompanied by the angels, she approached the foot of the throne, humbling herself anew. The Eternal Father said to her, Beloved, ascend higher. As these words, at the same time affected what they signified, she was raised up and placed on the throne of royal majesty with the three divine persons. New admiration was caused in the saints to see a mere creature exalted to such a dignity. Being made to understand the sanctity and equity of the works of the Most High, they gave new glory and praise, proclaiming him immense, just, holy, and admirable in all his counsels. The Father then spoke to the Blessed Mary, saying, My daughter, to thee do I entrust the church founded by my only begotten, the new law of grace he established in the world, and the people which he redeemed. To thee do I consign them all. Thereupon also the Holy Ghost spoke to her, My spouse, chosen from all creatures, I communicate to thee my wisdom and grace together, with which shall be deposited in thy heart the mysteries, the works, and teachings, and all that the incarnate word has accomplished in the world. And the Son also said, My most beloved mother, I go to my Father, and in my stead I shall leave thee, and I charge thee with the care of my church. To thee do I commend its children and my brethren, as the Father has consigned them to me. Then the three divine persons, addressing the choir of holy angels and the other saints, said, This is the Queen of all created things in heaven and earth. She is the protectress of the church, the mistress of creatures, the mother of piety, the intercessor of the faithful, the advocate of sinners, the mother of beautiful love and holy hope. She is mighty in drawing our will to mercy and clemency. In her shall be deposited the treasures of our grace and her most faithful heart shall the tablet whereon shall be written and engraved our holy law. In her are contained the mysteries of our omnipotence for the salvation of mankind. She is the perfect work of our hands through whom the plenitude of our desires shall be communicated and satisfied without hindrance in the currents of our divine perfections. Whoever shall call upon her from his heart shall not perish. Whoever shall obtain her intercession shall secure for himself eternal life. What she asks of us shall be granted, and we shall always hear her requests and prayers and fulfill her will, for she has consecrated herself perfectly to what pleases us. The Most Blessed Mary, Hearing herself thus exalted, humiliated herself so much the deeper, the more highly she was raised by the right hand of the Most High, above all the human and angelic creatures. As if she were the least of all, she adored the Lord and offered herself in the most prudent terms and the most ardent love to work as a faithful servant in the church and obey promptly all the biddings of the divine will. From that day on, she took upon herself anew the care of the evangelical church as a loving mother of all children. She renewed all the petitions she had until then made, so that during the whole further course of her life they were most fervent and incessant, 
as we shall see in the third part, where will appear more clearly what the church owes to this great queen and lady, and what blessings she gained and merited for it. On that same day, by divine dispensation, while the Lord was at table with the eleven apostles, other disciples and pious women gathered at the cenacle to the number of one hundred and twenty. For the divine master wished them to be present at his ascension. Moreover, just as he had instructed the apostles, so he now wanted to instruct these faithful respectively in what each was to know before his leaving them and ascending into heaven. All of them being thus gathered and united in peace and charity within those walls in the hall of the Last Supper, the author of life manifested himself to them as a kind and loving father and said to them, My sweetest children, I am about to ascend to my father, from whose bosom I descended in order to rescue and save men. I leave with you in my stead my own mother as your protectress, consoler, and advocate, and as your mother, whom you are to hear and obey in all things. Just as I have told you that he who sees me sees my father, and he who knows me knows also him, so I now tell you that he who knows my mother knows me. He who hears her hears me, and he who honors her honors me. All of you shall have her as your mother, as your superior and head, so shall all your successors. She shall answer doubts, solve her difficulties. In her, those who seek me shall always find me, for I shall remain in her until the end of the world. And I am in her now, although you do not understand how. This the Lord said because he was sacramentally present in the bosom of his mother, for the sacred species which she had received at the Last Supper were preserved in her until consecration of the first mass, as I shall relate further on. The Lord thus fulfilled that which he promised in St. Matthew, I am with you to the consummation of the world. The Lord added and said, You will have Peter as the supreme head of the church, for I leave him as my vicar, and you shall obey him as the chief high priest. St. John you shall hold as the son of my mother, for I have chosen and appointed him for this office on the cross. The Lord then looked upon his most beloved mother, who was there present, and intimated his desire of expressly commanding that whole congregation to worship and reference her in a manner suited to the dignity of mother of God, and of leaving this command under form of a precept for the whole church. But the most humble lady besought her only begotten to be pleased not to secure her more honor than was absolutely necessary for executing all that he had charged her with, and that the new children of the church should not be induced to show her greater honor than they had shown until then. On contrary, she desired to divert all the sacred worship of the church immediately upon the Lord himself, and to make the propagation of the gospel redound entirely to the exaltation of his holy name. Christ our Savior yielded to this most prudent petition of his mother, reserving to himself the duty of spreading the knowledge of her at a more convenient and opportune time, yet in secret, he conferred upon her new extraordinary favors, as shall appear in the rest of this history. In considering the loving exhortations of their divine master, the mysteries which he had revealed them, and the prospects of his leaving them, that whole congregation was moved to their inmost hearts, for he had enkindled in them the divine love by the vivid faith of his divinity and humanity. Reviving within them the memory of his words and his teachings of eternal life, the delights of his most loving companionship, and sorrowfully realizing that they were now all at once to be deprived of these blessings, they wept most tenderly and sighed from their inmost souls. They longed to detain him, although they could not, because they saw it was not befitting. Words of parting rose to their lips, but they could not bring themselves to utter them. Each one felt sentiments of sorrow arising amid feelings both of joy and yet also of pious regret. How shall we live without such a master, they thought. Who can ever speak to us such words of life and consolation as he? Who will receive us so lovingly and kindly? Who shall be our father and protector? We shall be helpless children and orphans in this world. Some of them broke their silence and exclaimed, O most loving Lord and Father, O joy and life of our souls, now that we know thee as our Redeemer, thou departest and leavest us. Take us along with thee, O Lord. Banish us not from thy sight. 
our blessed hope, what shall we do without thy presence? Whither shall we turn if thou goest away? Whither shall we direct our steps if we cannot follow thee, our Father, our Chief, and our Teacher? To these and other pleadings the Lord answered by bidding them not to leave Jerusalem and to persevere in prayer until he should send the Holy Spirit, the Consoler, as promised by the Father and as already foretold to the apostles at the Last Supper. Thereupon happened what I shall relate in the next chapter. The most auspicious hour in which the only begotten of the Eternal Father, after descending from heaven in order to assume human flesh, was to ascend by his own power and in a most wonderful manner to the right hand of God, in the inheritor of his eternities, one and equal with him in nature and infinite glory. He was to ascend also because he had previously descended to the lowest regions of the earth, as the apostles say, having fulfilled all that had been written and prophesied concerning his coming into the world, his life, death, and the redemption of man, and having penetrated, as the Lord of all, to the very center of the earth. By this ascension he sealed all the mysteries and hastened the fulfillment of his promise, according to which he was, with the Father, to send the paraclete upon the church after he himself should have ascended into heaven. In order to celebrate this festive and mysterious day, Christ our Lord selected as witnesses the 120 persons to whom, as related in the foregoing chapter, he had spoken in the Cenacle. They were the Most Holy Mary, the 11 Apostles, the 72 Disciples, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus their brother, and the other Marys, and the faithful men and women making up the above-mentioned number of 120. With this little flock, our divine shepherd Jesus left the Cenacle, and, with his most blessed mother at his side, he conducted them all through the streets of Jerusalem. The apostles and all the rest in order proceeded in the direction of Bethany, which was less than a half a league over the brow of Mount Olivet. The company of angels and saints from limbo and purgatory followed the victor with new songs of praise, although Mary alone was privileged to see them. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth was already divulged throughout Jerusalem and Palestine. Although the perfidious and malicious princes and priests had spread about the false testimony of his being stolen by his disciples, yet many would not accept their testimony nor give it any credit. It was divinely provided that none of the inhabitants of the city and none of the unbelievers or doubters should pay any attention to this holy procession or hinder it on its way from the cenacle. All except the 120 just, who were chosen by the Lord to witness his ascension into heaven, were justly punished by being prevented from noticing this wonderful mystery, and the chieftain and head of this procession remained invisible to them. The Lord, having thus secured them this privacy, they all ascended Mount Olivet to its highest point. There they formed three choirs, one of the angels, another of the saints, and a third of the apostles and faithful, which again divided into two bands, while Christ the Savior presided. Then the most prudent mother prostrated herself at the feet of her son, worshiping him with admirable humility. She adored him as the true God and as the Redeemer of the world, asking his last blessing. All the faithful there present imitated her and did the same. Weeping and sighing, they asked the Lord whether he was now to restore the kingdom of Israel. The Lord answered that this was the secret of the Eternal Father and not to be made known to them, but for the present it was necessary and befitting that they receive the Holy Ghost and preach in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and in all the world the mysteries of the redemption of the world. Jesus, having taken leave of this holy and fortunate gathering of the faithful, his countenance beaming forth peace and majesty, joined his hands and, by his own power, began to raise himself from the earth, leaving thereon the impression of his sacred feet. In gentlest motion, he was wafted toward the aerial regions, drawing after him the eyes and the hearts of those firstborn children, who amid sighs and tears vented their affection. And as at the moving of the first cause of all motion, it is proper that also the nether spheres should be set in motion. So the Savior drew after him also the celestial choirs of the angels, the holy patriarchs, and the rest of the glorified saints, some of them with body and soul, others only as to their soul. All of them in heavenly order were raised up together from the earth, accompanying and following their king, their chief, and head. 
the new and mysterious sacrament, which the right hand of the Most High wrought on this occasion for his Most Holy Mother, was that he raised her up with him in order to put her in possession of the glory which he had assigned to her as his true mother, and which she had, by her merits, prepared and earned for herself. Of this favor, the great queen was capable even before it happened, for her divine son had offered it to her during the forty days which he spent in her company after his resurrection. In order that this sacrament might be kept secret from all other living creatures at that time, and in order that the heavenly mistress might be present in the gathering of the apostles and the faithful in their prayerful waiting upon the coming of the Holy Ghost, the divine power enabled the Blessed Mother miraculously to be in two places at once, remaining with the children of the church for their comfort during their stay in the Senegal, and at the same time ascending with the Redeemer of the world to his heavenly throne, where she remained for three days. There she enjoyed the perfect use of all her powers and faculties, where she was more restricted in the use of them during that time in the Senegal. Amid this jubilee, the other rejoicings exceeding all our conceptions that newly divinely arranged procession approached Ephraim heavens. Between the two choirs of angels and saints, Christ and his most blessed mother made their entry. All in their order gave supreme honor to each respectively and to both together, breaking forth in hymns of praise in honor of the authors of grace and of life. Then the eternal father placed upon the throne of his divinity at his right hand, the incarnate word, and in such glory and majesty that he filled with new admiration and reverential fear all the inhabitants of heaven. In clear and intuitive vision, they recognized the infinite glory and perfection of the divinity, inseparably and substantially united in one personality to the most holy humanity, beautified and exalted by the preeminence and glory due to this union, such as eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor ever has entered into the thoughts of creatures. On this occasion, the humility and wisdom of our most prudent queen reached their highest point, for, overwhelmed by such divine and admirable favors, she hovered at the footstool of the royal throne, annihilated in the consciousness of being a mere earthly creature. Prostrate, she adored the Father and broke out in new canticles of praise for the glory communicated to his Son and for elevating in him the deified humanity to such greatness and splendor. Again, the angels and saints were filled with admiration and joy to see the most prudent humility of their queen, whose living example of virtue, as exhibited on that occasion, they emulated among themselves in copying. Then the voice of the Eternal Father was heard saying, My daughter, ascend higher. Her Divine Son also called her, saying, My mother, rise up and take possession of the place which I owe thee for having followed and imitated me. The Holy Ghost said, My spouse and beloved, come to my eternal embraces. Immediately was proclaimed to all the blessed the decree of the Most Holy Trinity, by which the Most Blessed Mother, for having furnished her own life blood toward the Incarnation, and for having nourished, served, imitated, and followed him with all the perfection possible to a creature, was exalted and placed at the right hand of her Son for all eternity. None other of the human creatures should ever hold that place or position, nor rival her in the unfailing glory connected with it, but it was to be reserved to the queen and to be her possession by right after her earthly life, as of one who preeminently excelled all the rest of the saints. In fulfillment of this decree, the most blessed Mary was raised to the throne of the Holy Trinity at the right hand of her son. At the same time, she, with all the saints, was informed that she was given possession of this throne not only for all the ages of eternity, but that it was left to her choice to remain there even now and without returning to the earth. For it was the conditional will of the divine persons that as far as they were concerned, she should now remain in that state. In order that she might make her own choice, she was shown anew the state of the church upon earth, the orphaned and necessitous condition of the faithful, whom she was left free to assist. This admirable proceeding of the divine providence was to afford the mother of mercy an occasion of going beyond, so to say, even her own self in doing good, and in obliging the human race with an act of love similar to that of her son, in assuming a passable state, and in suspending the glory due to his body during and for our redemption. The most blessed mother imitated him also in this respect, so that she might be in all things like the incarnate word. 
The great lady, therefore, having clearly before her eyes all the sacrifices included in this proposition, left the throne and, prostrating herself at the feet of the three persons, said, Eternal and almighty God, my Lord, to accept at once this reward, which thy condescending kindness offers me, would be to secure my rest. But to return to the world and continue to labor in mortal life for the good of the children of Adam and the faithful of thy holy church would be to the glory and according to the pleasure of thy majesty and would benefit my sojourning and banished children on earth. I accept this labor and renounce for the present the peace and joy of thy presence. Well do I know what I possess and receive, but I will sacrifice it to further the love thou hast for men. Accept, Lord and Master of all my being, this sacrifice, and let thy divine strength govern in the undertaking combined to me. Let faith in thee be spread. Let thy holy name be exalted. Let thy holy church be enlarged, for thou hast acquired it by the blood of thy only begotten and mine. I offer myself anew to labor for thy glory and for the conquest of the souls as far as I am able. Such was the sacrifice made by the most loving mother and queen, one greater than ever was conceived by creature. And it was so pleasing to the Lord that he immediately rewarded it by operating in her those purifications and enlightenments, which I have at other times mentioned as necessary to the intuitive vision of the divinity. For so far she had on this occasion seen only by abstractive vision. Thus elevated, she partook of the beatific vision and was filled with splendor and celestial gifts, altogether beyond the power of man to describe or conceive in mortal life. In order to finish this chapter, and with it this second part, I return to the congregation of the faithful, whom we left so sorrowful on Mount Olivet. The Most Holy Mary did not forget them in the midst of her glory, as they stood weeping and lost in grief, and, as it were, absorbed in looking into the aerial regions, into which the Redeemer and Master had disappeared. She turned her eyes upon them from the cloud on which she had ascended, in order to send them her assistance. Moved by their sorrow, she besought Jesus lovingly to console these little children, whom he had left as orphans upon the earth. Moved by the prayers of his mother, the Redeemer of the human race sent down two angels in white and resplendent garments, who appeared to all the disciples and the faithful and spoke to them. Ye men of Galilee, do not look up to heaven in so great astonishment, for this Lord Jesus, who departed from you and has ascended into heaven, shall again return with the same glory and majesty in which you have just seen him. By such words and others, which they added, they consoled the apostles and disciples and all the rest, so that they might not grow faint, but in their retirement hope for the coming and the consolation of the Holy Ghost promised by their divine master. And now the words of the Queen. The Virgin Mary speaks to Sister Mary of Agreda. My daughter, that will appropriately close this second part of my life by remembering the lesson concerning the most efficacious sweetness of the divine love and the immense liberality of God with those souls that do not hinder its flowing. It is in conformity with the inclinations of his holy and perfect will to regale rather than afflict creatures, to console them rather than cause them sorrow, to reward them rather than to chastise them, to rejoice rather than grieve them. But mortals ignore this divine science because they desire from the hands of the Most High such consolations, delights, and rewards as are earthly and dangerous, and they prefer them to the true and more secure blessings. The divine love then corrects this fault by the lessons conveyed in tribulations and punishments. Human nature is slow, coarse, and uneducated, and if it is not cultivated and softened, it gives no fruit in season and on account of its evil inclinations, will never of itself become fit for the most loving and sweet interactions with the highest good. Therefore, it must be shaped and reduced by the hammer of adversities, refined in the crucible of tribulation, in order that it may become fit and capable of the divine gifts and favors, and may learn to despise terrestrial and fallacious goods, wherein death is concealed. I counted for little all that I endured, when I saw the reward which the divine goodness had prepared for me, and therefore he ordained in his admirable providence that I should return to the militant church of my own free will and choice. This I knew would redound to my greater glory and to the exaltation of his holy name, while it would provide assistance to his church and to his children in an admirable and holy manner. 
It seemed to me a sacred duty that I deprive myself of the eternal felicity of which I was in possession and, returning from heaven to earth, gain new fruits of labor and love for the Almighty. This I owe to the divine goodness, which had raised me up from the dust. Learn, therefore, my beloved, from my example, and excite thyself to imitate me most eagerly during these times, in which the Holy Church, so disconsolate and overwhelmed by tribulations, and in which there are none of her children to console her. In this cause I desire that thou labor strenuously, ready to suffer in prayer and supplication, and crying from the bottom of thy heart to the Omnipotent. And if it were necessary, thou shouldst be willing to give thy life. I assure thee, my daughter, thy solicitude shall be very pleasing in the eyes of my divine Son and in mine. Let it all be for the glory and honor of the Most High, the King of the ages, the immortal and invisible, and for that of his mother, the Most Blessed Mary, through all eternities. Mm -hmm.